Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm David Blight, uh, director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery and Abolition at Yale. This is uh, one of our occasional uh, podcasts, and this one we're doing happily live, live streaming out across the world. There are a lot of you who have joined us today. Thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, many of you are probably in the field of Latin American history, Cuban history, and others are just uh, participants uh, in our regular podcast. Uh, this is a thrill. Um, Manuel Barcia is a, is a true favorite of ours here at the GLC. He was a fellow here at the GLC just a few years ago. Um, I will introduce him more thoroughly in a, just a second. Um, but he has helped us, uh, indeed has done most of the labor, to organize our, our major conference this fall, which uh, starts one week from tomorrow, November 6th, and runs both days, 6th and 7th. We're doing it all online. This is a new experiment. Everything's a new experiment these days, isn't it? But we're going to do a full two-day conference. Uh, we're going to keep the papers a little shorter uh, because of all of us looking into screens. But we're doing the full-fledged conference on Cuban slavery in the Atlantic world, a subject in itself that we've never taken up. It is our 22nd annual conference, and it is about an extremely important place in the world in the history of slavery. Uh, in a moment, uh, Manuel will say a few words about the conference as well. Um, we're here to talk about Manuel's new book, um, but let me introduce him in, in his full background, because uh, this is his fourth book, uh, single authored book, and he's also been editor of other books. Uh, Manuel uh, grew up in Cuba. He was an undergraduate at the University of Havana. He took his MA and his PhD at the University of Essex in the UK. He taught at the University of Essex and at the University of Nottingham before moving to Leeds University uh, in England in, I think, 2004, um, where he has taught ever since. And he is now the chair of global history at the University of Leeds. He's one of the most prominent scholars of Cuba, uh, Atlantic world slavery, and of the slave trade uh, in the world. Uh, and in 2014, he received one of those uh, very prestigious uh, fellowship honors that the British government gives called the Leverhulme Prize. Uh, believe me, I have uh, many British friends in this field, and that's what everybody <laughs> tries to achieve, a Leverhulme, which gives you time off and time to write. And uh, whatever time, Manuel, you had off, you've certainly been writing. Uh, he's the author first of the book West African Warfare in Bahia and Cuba, uh, Soldier Slaves in the Atlantic World. Uh, he's also the author of The Great African Slave Revolt of 1825 in Cuba. Uh, that came out in 2012. And he's the author of Seeds of Insurrection, which I think was your first book, um, Domestic and Slave Resistance in the Cuban Plantations. That came out in 2008. And we are here to discuss his brand new book, uh, which I'm holding up and you can see on the poster, The Yellow Demon of Fever, Fighting Disease in the 19th Century Transatlantic Slave Trade. Um, much more about the book in a moment. We're going to have a conversation about the book, and it's been a pleasure for me to read this. Um, but Manuel, a special welcome. Thank you for doing Thank this. You. And thank you for helping us organize next week's conference. Would yeah. you say a word or two about the conference, who's in yeah. it, how you helped us so much to organize it, the scope of it? Uh, yeah, sure. And then, um, and then we'll circle back to your book. Okay. Um, thank you very much, and I, I want to thank uh, I want to thank you. I want to thank Michelle, Daniel, uh, Melissa. I mean the whole the whole GLC Tom. The whole GSC, you shouldn't forget Tom, the whole GSC family. Um, you know, that, uh, I, I really feel like, like, a, like a family to me, um, even Same. though you're across, a, across the pond. Um, uh, I, I, can, I can say a word or two about this conference. I always start by saying that I'm not, I, I haven't 
organized this conference. I have co-organized this conference. And I, I need to mention here Adriana Kira uh, from Emory University and wow. Anele from, from Yale as well, who have co-organized this with me. They have been there all the time. And, and quite a few other um, uh, scholars who are going to be participating in the conference and who have been coming in and out whenever we need them to, to give suggestions and, and uh, to help us with different things. It, it, the, the story of how this conference started, this, I, I actually remember how this came up. It was your idea. Uh, but it was, um, it was this uh, one afternoon that Adriana Kira was giving a, um, a lecture at, at the ELC, uh, which was, of course, on Cuban slavery. And when, when you commented on, the, on, the, on, on her paper, you suggested that maybe we should organize a conference on, on Cuban slavery. And after the, the talk, the two of us, we came to you and we said, hey, we're on. <laughs> Right. And then, yeah. yeah, and then from then on, it I say that one. all the time, and sometimes we do the conferences. <laughs> yeah, when it went quite straightforward. We picked the year 2020 in the hope that we would meet in person, and you see, mm. uh, 2020, eh? and we thought 2016 was bad. Anyway, um, so um, this this conference, basically, I think, as you say, is kind of overdue. you. Uh, they have been before conference on Cuban slavery here and there, but I think that what makes this this conference. Um, special, if you wish, is um, uh, not only actually the, 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 the number of people that we have and, and the different expertise uh, that we have across, across the board. I think that this is a conference that brings people from different um, areas, not only historians, but also the fact that we are actually looking at Cuba within a wider Atlantic world. Um, mm -hmm. Something that, that, that still happens to a certain extent with, with many historical narratives is that people focus on on specific places and specific actors. Mm -hmm. And they try to, to understand the history of these people within, or these places within, a, 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 I would call it like a bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and sometimes some of these connections that go way beyond um, uh, these places and people in both in space and time are lost. Uh, I think that this conference is trying to address that, is trying to place Cuba within a wider um, um, framework of analysis and bringing people, I mean, the, the keynote is going to be Professor Ada Ferrer from New York University. And, and we have a, a number of scholars, both from the Europe that are, are going to participate as well. So we wanted to bring more people from Cuba, I have to say, and we will have probably done so, but obviously the, the internet connection there is not um, yeah. the best to, to do we this. Were gonna, we were going to fly more people here yeah. than we're going to yes. be able to have on the internet, which yeah. We we'll have it's to change the program, of, actually. Part of this lunatic world we live in. Uh, we, <laughs> we could have got them here physically, but we can't get them on the internet in, in Cuba. Yeah, but uh, we, should, we should actually, uh, uh, you know, try to, to circulate information as wide as possible. I think it's, there, there are quite a few interventions here which are actually game changers. I think that this is going to be, and it's also going to be a, a, a lift up uh, after, after November the 3rd. Hey, that's great, and you would know. Um, yeah, and I, I should say that uh, Daniel Vera, who's our uh, our media expert making all this happen, uh, tells us that uh, we're over 300 people have pre-registered for that conference, and we're still a week out. So that that's remarkable. Um, that's more than we could get in person. We have to keep admitting that, I guess. But now to your book. Uh, and we did this, of course, in part because your book is new, it's just out from Yale University Press, I must say, and your editor, Adina Burke, is on this program today uh, as a viewer. Um, and we wanted to do this as an anticipation of the conference, but also because of the book itself. Now, uh, this book is essentially a study of the world of disease in the Atlantic slave trade, and all that means, in the 19th century, essentially from uh, the British end of the slave trade, uh, and then the American alleged end of the slave trade, and then into the kind of post-1820 uh, world of Atlantic slaving, which is still conducted, of course, by the Spanish and the Portuguese, and sometimes by others. Um, but you take the approach here uh, as a in, wearing one of your many hats as a historian of science and medicine uh, about this world uh, in the last decades of the slave trade of disease. Um, 
a world in which uh, everyone was caught up in this, this epidemiological universe of many diseases, especially the fever diseases, but lots of others as well. A world of shared diseases all across all lines, whether it was a crew on a ship or the slaves in the hold or the captain for that matter. And then all along the coast of Africa, the coast of the Americas. Uh, when I got through with your book, I wondered, my God, how did this, this traffic even continue in this world of disease? Why didn't the disease completely win this battle? But we can come back to that. It, it is a book uh, to the audience out there that is, is very much about people and human beings, but it's also about the pathogens. And God, is that relevant to us today? We, we're talking about disease and, and, and epidemics and pandemics every day of our lives. But this is also a book about power, the power of colonialism. So I'd like you to first, Manuel, just sort of describe your sense of the scope of this book, how you organized it, and if you could, a bit about the extraordinary research that you did to pull this book off. Well, um, first, probably I should say that I didn't plan for this book to come out in the middle of a pandemic, okay? <laughs> um, I promise I don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> Timing is everything. I, yeah, I know, but you know, it's, it's been kind of a revelation having to talk about, about uh, disease and actually uh, at a more personal level, actually experiencing many of the things that, that uh, the subjects of my book experience kind yeah. of fears, anxieties, and trying to find out what's going on, yeah. uh, and dealing with, with um, um, public uh, policy measures that uh, sometimes makes no sense at all, uh, right. or the lack of public uh, policy um, at some point as well. You know, um, one of the central themes of your book, in my reading, is this idea of dread. Yeah, it is. It Fear, is yeah. terror of disease in that yeah. era. Go ahead. I, I actually wonder what, whether I would have written the same book right now. Probably we have had more dread right now. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I think that there are two or three things that I, that I have to say. I, I actually got, first of all, I, I don't consider myself a medical historian or a historian of medicine. Mm. I think that I am a neophyte at best, and, and definitely I'm, this was kind of an adventure. Mm. Um, I, I've been. Well, you I've can talk, talk pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been reading quite a lot about this for many years, and, and I had colleagues who have uh, helped me. Uh, and I mentioned them in the, in the acknowledgement. I mean, more than I, I would expect from a friend, but I mean, they have been really supportive. And um, to a certain extent, I think it was a result of, of gathering bits of information here and there. And eventually I had such a massive amount of information about, about stuff that related to diseases and, and medical practices and, and, and medical transfer, I mean, medical knowledge transfer, mm -hmm. that I had to do something with it. And, and I thought, you know what, let's, let's give it a go and, and let's try to, to write a book. One day I woke up in the morning and I kind of, I could see the, the structure of the book in my head. And from then on, it was um, quite straightforward. Um, I think that there are two things here that, that are worth mentioning here. The first one has to do with the fact that I, for many years now, um, I, have, I have always been a fan of David Armitage. Oh, yeah. Um, um, yeah, his, his categorization of the Atlantic from the early uh, 21st century. Mm -hmm. I know for some people actually, I had this discussion with colleagues some people see it as passé. I, 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 for me, it's still really, really exciting to, to actually see the, the Atlantic, the way that, to a certain extent, David saw the Atlantic 20 years ago. Um, and, and I have always been interested in writing a second Atlantic history of something, right? Mm -hmm. And this was opportunity. And I think that more than anything else, that's what led me to write this book. I, I saw, okay, I have documents from archives and libraries from all over the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, in, in several different languages. Uh, and, and somehow, they actually, they kind of they fit together. They, I, I can put them together. And, and that um, uh, pretty much led me to write the book. There was one more thing, I think, that, um, that I, I really fancy about this book. And so when I started write, uh, reading about medical history of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery more widely, I realized that most of the stuff that we have, most of the studies are for the period precisely before the abolition of the slave trade, uh -huh. uh, which so was a legal period 
18th century material. Yeah, and, and yeah. before, because everything was written down. Um, our transactions were legal, even though there were people who were going off the, right. the books, there was smuggling and piracy, et cetera, et cetera. But for the 19th century, this inf information in general actually is, is less forthcoming because every, every, all these slave traders that we, you were mentioning before, that they continue, uh, mm -hmm. and in spite of everything, they go on the ground. Mm -hmm. and, and the information is less forthcoming. So I, I really saw it as, as a, a very yeah. interesting challenge. Mm. So you had done a lot of research for your previous books that still carried over into this book. Yeah. And disease, this environment of disease, became sort of the common denominator. Uh, yeah. this, epi this epidemiological world that was the slave trade. Say a few more things, if you would, for our non-specialist audience about just, even though, even though the British end their foreign slave trade and... 07, the Americans mostly in 08. Uh, nevertheless, the slave trade remains profitable. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's still this engine of profit and growth in the 19th century for these empires. Um, how so, and how profitable, and how successful was slavery still growing from Brazil all the way to North America? Yeah, it, it was very profitable, and, and the very fact that it goes uh, on the ground actually makes it even more yeah. profitable. Because um, it's mostly I, I think, illegal it, now. It's mostly it is, <laughs> it is a business, you know, it is a business. If there is demand and there is supply, there is a business. And, and in the 19th century, I usually uh, tend to make, to, to kind of uh, that, uh, use this um, semi-joke with my students. Um, and sugar was pretty much what, what, what oil is today in the international market, you know. So sugar was the deal. If you could produce sugar, you would make money. And, and I was having a discussion it's with... It's still a good uh, drug, let's face it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. I actually quit, but yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, mostly, mostly. Um, so, uh, for instance, I was talking to, to John Harris, who also has a book uh, on the latest slave trade coming out, coming out Soon with Yale University Press, the, mm -hmm. I think the title is The Last Slave Ships, if I go well. I mm -hmm. haven't read the book yet, uh, which I'm holding against him. Um, and, and we were talking about the, this, this um, idea that, uh, that the slave traders would come up with very often, and they would put it in, in writing, that um, if, if you send three ships to Africa and you get one back, you're still making a substantial profit out mm -hmm. of the whole enterprise. So yeah. that, 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 that would, in, in some cases, I understand that they would send the ships together, and in case of the British or, or the French or whoever would come after them, they will capture one of the ships, the other ones will make it across the Atlantic, that was good, that was fine. And not only that ships would, would be seized by patrols, but for, for now, decades and decades and decades, factoring in loss of yeah. the slave, of the people, and these slave ships had, had long been now part of the, I mean, that, that had been worked through for a century and a half, yeah. two centuries really. Um, so that, I mean, and it's sometimes it's hard to get your head around the sheer numbers of these ships and the numbers of loss at sea, and then the numbers of loss even after arrival, but they're factoring in all this loss, loss yeah. of human life, loss of people, even loss of their crews. Yeah for that matter, because at the other end, it's still that profitable. And, and there are several lines of business here. You know, there is credit, which is mm -hmm. happening from the US in many cases, or even from Britain, um, and supplies of, of, of merchandise that needs to be exchanged for, for enslaved Africans in, in Africa. There is insurance, both from the US, and also yeah. from places like Cuba or Brazil. There are, there are insurance, it's, it's a booming business during this period as well. So, um, in, in many respects, it's a very profitable business and, and yeah. it carries on regardless. And people die. You know, if you read the book, you will notice people, all kinds of people are going to be dying there. Oh, yeah. Uh, but they are, they are mostly going to be dying of disease, not of other things. And they know it. Yeah. That, that's part of your story here. They know it. I mean, I suppose a crewman didn't have many options back in Liverpool and Bristol and wherever yeah. else. Uh, or... Uh, Spain and Portugal, Lisbon. Um, yeah. Now, I'd like you all, again, for specialists and non specialists, you have this phrase contact zones. Yeah. All the various contact zones between Africans, Europeans, uh, Americans, 
from the west coast of Africa or all around Africa yeah. to the ships themselves, to the arrival places. In the, I mean, talk about that, if you would, because this is where the diseases are all yeah. contacted. This is where this world of, you call them health practitioners over time, begin to yeah. try to blunt these diseases, sometimes making them worse than they do better. Yeah. But talk about these various contact zones in this world of disease that was just a constant. Yeah, well, um, you know, the, con the, the, the concept uh, of contact zones is uh, Mary Louise Pratt's. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and um, I pretty much learned from her, I have to say, okay. both reading and, and talking to her many years ago. Okay. Um, well, I was giving I, you credit for it, but that's all right. <laughs> no, 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 it's not mine. <laughs> uh, but I did kind of that, that, that play with it, and I, I started talking about slave trade contact zones, because um, whereas she talks about spaces of colonial encounter, yeah. these are not necessarily colonial. And, no. and, this, and this is all about our human beings as well. And, and, you know, these are spaces where, whether this is a slave ship or it's a, 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 an anti-slave trade patrol ship, or it's a barracoon, in on the coast of Africa, or is or is a, a reception center somewhere in the Americas or any, elsewhere? Um, these are these are shared spaces where people come into contact and they they, they change uh, uh, merchandise, they change body fluids, they change uh, obviously diseases, they change all kind of things, and and um, and they are and bitten course, by the same mosquitoes. Yeah, they are. And, and, and yeah, they bring stuff with them. They bring ticks with them. They bring fleas with them. They bring stuff with them in general. And and of course, these these are places where where this interaction is going to be it's, it's going to create environments that they are ripe for for the spread of disease. Yeah. Um, if if you think about COVID, and I'm sorry, I'm going to bring COVID every now and then. Hey. Think about COVID. We keep talking about social distancing. Well, yeah. there is a reason for that. You know, like oh. the closer we come, as 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 populations of, as human population since the yeah. more likely numbers of, of um, people sick of any given disease irrespective of how they are transmitted and, and and the proof is that if you look at the maps where cases of COVID are happening today they are happening mostly in urban environments mm -hmm. even though in some broader environments people are, are behaving in ways that they defy um, all, all advice all, all scientific and medical advice but still are the, the cities are the ones that, that are suffering the most and this is the same in this environment, this and, and you also have to, to understand that these people are working with a very um, 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 inaccurate um, um, knowledge of what's happening around them. It's, it's yeah. really they are really trying to make do with whatever they have. And, and if you think, for instance, COVID again, yeah. we have the first cases in November of last year, and in, in November of this year, we may have a, the first vaccine, the first working vaccine. It's yeah. been a year. These people are going to spend decades or even centuries trying to figure out what is producing a disease, how right. it's being transmitted, and how, and how you deal with that. What, yeah. or how can you make a prognosis? About, I actually talk about the fevers as a category, for instance. There mm -hmm. are so many fevers in this, in the, in this yeah. context zones. Yellow, yellow fever is only similar. one of them. Yellow fever, dengue fever, all kinds of fevers. Uh, and, and, this, and they, they look similar. They have similar symptoms. And not that they're not trying to get something like vaccines in that era, but they just don't know how. I mean, you have some, frankly, incredibly graphic descriptions of things they would do to try to imagine if, if that could be a vaccine. Well, you brought it up. So talk a bit, if you would, about this world of medical knowledge. I mean, oh. it's a loose, loose term to call it medical knowledge, but it, yeah. you know, what were the theories about uh, the transmission of all these diseases, uh, much less the treatments? But th there were a lot of yeah. different versions of how this all came about yeah. in the late 18th and then well into the 19th century that are frankly shocking to some of us today. Um, sometimes they were using what could be called science, sometimes they weren't. I mean, what, what, what is this world of medical knowledge in which these slave ships are moving across yeah. the Well, you know, it's, um, I have to be careful how I, I phrase this again because I'm not a, a historian of medicine per se, but um, there is a... Well, you fooled me. I, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to be slapped in the face later on. Um, I, I um, uh, figuratively, by the way, slap in the face. Um, I, 
I think that one thing that I didn't want to do when I wrote this book before before I get exactly to what you're asking is is to to um, write a narrative of uh, you know the the advance of medical knowledge or the advance yeah. of good medicine you know this this kind of wish um, um, we are all moving forward etc cetera, etc cetera, was pretty much out of what I wanted to do uh, yeah. but but at the same time in this period there are there are medical it's, it's a process of trial and error of, or, or yeah. hit and miss yeah. uh, that is eventually going to, to, to yield certain results that are going, and, and this links with the, the power narrative as well, the power argument, they are going to lead eventually to Europeans mm -hmm. to be able to settle in Africa. And, and, and a few years later, in 1885, the European nations in Berlin to say, you know what, we can actually sp split this continent in, into pieces and, and, and each of us takes a few of them. <clears throat> before that they couldn't because they would die you know mm -hmm. um most of them would die anyway um but throughout the period that i'm looking here which is mostly mostly the first half of the 19th century although i mm -hmm. i go into a second half as well um there are certain certain overlapping um ways of understanding disease um uh, one of them is for instance the homeopathic method which mm -hmm. is still going on uh, maybe some people in our audience today believe in homeopathy you don't know um <laughs> We have the um, we have the um, the theory, the ancient Greek um, theory of um, the, the body fluids, the humoral, mm -hmm. uh, and that said that the, the balance of different fluids in your body um, uh, made for you being healthy or not. Uh, and then we have um, uh, the the uh, the moral, um, if you wish. Uh, approach to disease, we pretty much blame people or people's choices of uh, life choices for how they contracted diseases and having great. sex with the natives or or yeah. drinking too much alcohol or even eating too much or even exposing yourself to the dews or to the to the mm -hmm. sun or wearing the wrong clothes every every life choice could be a subject to to um, to criticism mm -hmm. in very late in the period very very late in the period gen theory start coming through yeah little by little. But throughout this period, perhaps the one that actually um, carries the most weight is, is miasma theory or miasma theory, right. Uh, right. which basically was, was an approach, at, uh, an, an environmental approach that claimed that um, this, the diseases that were associated with environments and, and for instance, putrefaction and exhalation from rotting matter and that kind of things were likely to create disease. And, and as such, environments needed to be sanitize and cure just the same way that people were. And, yeah. and um, to a certain extent, they were right, which is an interesting thing here. They, they didn't figure it out. But if you think swamps, this is where mosquitoes reproduce. Yeah. So if you dry out the swamp, there is an improvement, likely improvement in public health. And when they could, they actually would try to drain swamps. Because yeah, they would. Oh, yeah, my asthma is where it's supposed to be coming from. And they weren't entirely wrong on that. Yeah. Uh, even if they didn't understand the role of the mosquito, but, but then if you also, well, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, just 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 to say, but if you if you if you read the book, there are people who are actually making the connection between the mosquito and the yeah, yeah, yeah. Disease. That's right. That's right. They, they cannot are. they cannot really say how it's happening, but they are actually making the connection. Well, that's one of the the, the ironies in your book. I mean, uh, one of the fascinations for me is this world of just terrible horror and death and. <laughs> you know, unending disease that is just crushing people. Nevertheless, there are medical, there's something you might call medical progress being made. And it's, and it's being made in, a, in what you call in, in a shared way. Europeans and Africans are bringing different kinds of practices, knowledge, and, and even herbs and so on to this process. And some of this works and some of it doesn't. They also start, of course, using quarantine, which yeah. another word we've all been using far more than we wish for months. They started quarantines, right? They began yeah. to realize, well, if you separate these people, then you have a better chance. Uh, how did they start doing that? And at least on the, on the edges of the Atlantic, you, you don't quarantine people on a ship. You just can't. Uh, although they tried even there, didn't they? They would put-, put Yeah, no, no, they, they, the they always try, yeah. Yeah. God. Well, the, for a start, the quarantine is something that is happening only on the legal side of, of 
of the slave right. trade. Yeah, when so the slave traders the... in Africa, they are not quarantining anybody. They are just playing it by ear and, yeah. and you know, hoping to get lucky. And some of them do get very lucky. Uh, but so when they have the claims courts and they seize a the ship, they bring yeah. it in and they quarantine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but but there is there an argument here as, as um, uh, to to, uh, to to what extent quarantines actually work, and and we know that quarantines may work now. We know back then it was very conflicting knowledge. Yeah. Um, we know we know quarantines may work with certain diseases, and they may not work at all with others. Because what you do is you you you, you separate um, a group of people who are supposed to be sick, so with smallpox or whatever, and you put them. Um, um, in a separate building, a few meters away from the rest of the population, maybe downwind, so they don't they don't infect people. But in reality, if you have people with yellow fever, the mosquitoes are going to fly. They are going mm -hmm. to cover the distance. Mm -hmm. um, so you're really not doing much. Malaria is the same thing, and and there are quite a lot of diseases for which quarantines don't work. But what quarantines do, mm -hmm. <laughs> something that we're seeing today, is they are a measure of, to a certain extent, of social engineering. And mm. what Alison Basford called the dream of hygienic containment, which means that you give um, this impression that you are in control. You know mm. what you're doing, you know. Um, I know I know that in the United States, this is not really the case right now, that, you know, science is not really that important or it's not being listened to, but in a normal place, people would at least pretend they listen to science and they would try to convince the population that this implementing these, these measures actually leads to public safety. Right. And they, and they set up and they establish a trade-off as they do that. Because yes, I'm going to protect you, but I'm going to limit your movement. I'm going to limit your um, um, uh, uh, possibilities to trade or to work right. or, or to have sex with, to go out and have sex with a with the Atlantic, uh, uh, in the Atlantic brothers at the end of the city or whatever else. So yeah. there is a, a trade-off, which is, we're seeing it today again. Yeah, yeah. You know, and one of the ways you organize your book, and it, it, it I mean, it, 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 it puts an order into this world of sheer chaos, is you divide the work into chapters that are about the slave ships, about the patrol ships, these, these, these are the, the British ships patrolling to try to capture slavers. And then um, the, the places in the coast of the Americas that take in the slaves. I mean, you, but what you're showing is that disease just ran through everybody, yeah. including the patrol ships. Yeah. And they all find their, in some ways, their worst enemy is disease. Um, nobody's immune. Uh, from anything. And I, I like that part of the, your organization. Talk a bit about that because the fate of crews here and captains and the traders themselves is virtually the same statistically as it is for the slaves, at least close to it. Um, yeah. Nobody was safe. Yeah. Um, be before I answer this, um, um, I just want to mention that uh, those who are typing questions in the q and I will answer the questions at the end, I promise. Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, okay. we're taking in good... I'm, I'm, I'm actually paying attention. I, oh, I well, actually... I am too, Manuel. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, we're, we're, um, we, we invite questions out there, and we've already got two or three yeah. good ones. Yeah. But please keep them coming, and we'll yeah. get them. Right. Um, these places, all of them, um, they are going to... Yeah, disease is going to reach everywhere, and... and, and um, first of all, just, just to make it kind of a small correction, it's not only British ships, there are also French, American, mm -hmm. uh, Portuguese, they are all involved in implementing these abolitionist policies. Yeah. And, and one of the, um, the conclusions actually that I draw in this book is that the implementation of abolition, uh, implementing abolition in, in, in the Atlantic, actually is going to, to lead to an increase in suffering, human suffering. Yeah. It's a, an unwanted consequence, but it happens. Yeah. There, are, there are multiple descriptions from different witnesses showing that the, 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 the strongest the strongest blockade of, of the African coast, so that Africans cannot come out, the, the, the more likely enslaved Africans are, are to suffer and, and to die um, because of that. Yeah, uh, because some of the slavers had to spend more time yeah. to load their ships, right? And they yeah. run out of supplies, and they had even, even more crowded barracoons. Yeah. There, are, there are a million reasons for that. But, just, just to to um to engage with what you said, I, the slave. I, I divided the, the these three chapters like that because it 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 makes kind of sense to look at the the the, the, 
micro words of these people, of each yeah. of them, and how they dealt with it. Because at the end, one thing that I wanted to, to demonstrate, that I set out to demonstrate, is that the medical knowledge, the fragmentary medical knowledge to use Pablo Gomez, okay, that they are going to, to share, they're going to, to acquire, they are going to share it with each other. It do, and, and two things. First of all, this is state-of-the-art knowledge at the yeah. time. Yeah. Okay? And that goes for everybody here. Written they down are actually, <laughs> yeah, they are, they, are, they are up to date with what is happening in Europe and all that. Yeah. Uh, many, of, many of these practitioners are European as well. Um, and what is happening in Africa and the Americas as well. And, and the second thing is that they, they are going to, to, to share. This is, the disease is the only thing that these people have in, as, as a common enemy. They are fighting each other. They are dealing with each other, chasing each other, running away from each other, but they all have disease as an enemy. And, mm -hmm. and they, they try to help each other whenever possible. And, and they all, to a certain extent, try to keep the Africans that they enslaved and they are taken to a, across the Atlantic for one reason or another, as healthy as possible. The, the slave traders, they want to make a profit. So they, the more Africans they take to the other side of the Atlantic, they, they, they higher the profit. So it's, it's a purely uh, business-minded uh, uh, decision. It has nothing to do with being kind or compassionate or anything like that. Uh, and, the and, numbers, and the sheer numbers in the ships keep increasing yeah. because of these death rates. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the other, the other the anti-slave trade patrols, at least the British ones, they are going to make money for every African they liberate. Yeah. Right? So they also have a, a, a financial incentive um, to, uh, to keep mm. these people alive. So they are all going to try, but what, what it becomes very um, clear to them is that it doesn't matter how well you are prepared for this. It doesn't matter whether you are in a slave ship or you are in a, in a ship that is trying to, to bring the slave trade to an end, or whether you're in one of these reception centers associated with, with one side or the other of the conflict, they are all going to come into contact with these diseases. And once they arrive, specifically the epidemic ones, thinking smallpox, yellow fever, um, they, they immediately um, follow the same pattern, which is they are going to get sick and they are going to die in droves. Because at the time, most of the medical um, uh, therapies to deal with all of these diseases were, and I'm, I'm saying here, but most of them were um, mercury, the use of mercury, sulfate of mercury, which was poisonous. Right. Um, the use of purgatives and bloodletting, both of which debilitated the patient on top so of the mercury, poison that was being given. Mercury, purgation, yeah. and bloodletting. Blood but well, you know, this is the age of heroic medicine. And I always joke that in the slave trade, in the legal slave trade, yeah. this is the age of heroic medicine on steroids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are well, just taking this well, to a complete different level. You need a dark sense of humor to even be in this field. Yeah. Um, could you say a word about how those claims courts operate? So a British, whether it's in Bahia in Brazil or up in the Caribbean in Havana or wherever, yeah. how did they actually function? These patrols bring in a ship, but still the, pro the problem is hardly over. Then in fact, as you yeah. show, it actually got worse. Yeah, it got worse. Yeah. Uh, I mean, first of all, there are two types of courts here. There are the, the, the government courts, mm -hmm. which in the case of the British, they are the vice admiralty courts, but the French, they have their own courts. Yeah. Um, um, the Portuguese, they have their own, their own courts. Um, if a French, let's put it this way, if a French ship would capture a French uh, a slave ship, they would take it to a court, say, in Gore Island in Senegal, mm. or Sweden, mm. Senegal. Mm. So it would be a very straightforward process, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. If a British ship would capture a slave ship, or was British, they would take it to a nearest, by some minute, it would be a fast process, a very straightforward process. What happened here is that the British also enforce, um, um, the, the, when, when they start forcing different European powers to sign abolition treaties, and eventually everybody, um, they set up mixed commission courts in different parts of the right. Atlantic. And these mixed right. commission courts have, each of them had two, uh, um, uh, had two branches. One in a British colony, which all of them were in the same British colony in, in Free Town in Sierra Leone, and one in, the, in, the, in, in a colony of the other, or, or not necessarily in a colony, in a territory that belonged to the, to the other signatory of the treaty. Mm -hmm. So say Rio de Janeiro was both um, Anglo-Portuguese and then Anglo-Brazilian, um, Luanda was Anglo-Portuguese, uh, Havana was Anglo-Spanish, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And this created a massive, massive mess up. There is no other way of putting this. <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually writing about a, a, a slave ship where there is a, a case of, of an accusation of white cannibalism. 
um, in 1837, and this ship is captured. It's, it's, it's a Cuban ship, but it has Portuguese papers, which is what defines the ship. Uh -huh. And this ship is captured off the western coast of Cuba. Mm. The Africans are landed in Jamaica because they are dying. There's another way of putting it. Mm. And then, rather than taking the ship to, say, Jamaica or to Havana, where there is an Anglo-Spanish commission court, they have to take it to an Anglo-Portuguese commission court. Mm. There are two at the time. One is in Luanda. The other one is in Freetown. So they have to cross the Atlantic. God. To take this ship to to take this ship to trial, which only, only the suffering just that yeah, many more weeks. Yeah. Uh, usually, the Africans will go with the ship. This is an exceptional case. Usually, they will go across the Atlantic with the ship, the Maria de Gloria. It's a very famous case that the, the Africans went three times across the Atlantic, and and then the ship, by the way, is sold to the same slave traders who send it back to Cuba to continue to be uh, participating in the slave trade for three more years, yeah. two more years, until it sinks. So what an irony to, to make the slave trade illegal that made it more deadly in many ways. Yeah. Oh my it wasn't God. a wanted consequence, to be honest. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, wanna, I want you to talk about one other element of the book here before we go to questions, and it's piling up on us. But one of the things I loved about the book, and I already said this perhaps, is that it, it isn't just about all these abstract processes and abstract numbers of people dying. It's about real people and real ships in real places. I'd like to ask you to just briefly talk about three of them. You start chapters with these stories. First is the ship called Le Jeune Louis, uh, which I believe was 1825. Uh, this, is a ship, this is a slave ship that had a terrible outbreak of, well, everything, dysentery, fevers, but also ophthalmia, do I pronounce that right? Which is blindness. Yeah. Even the crew was going blind yeah. when it's discovered. Could you say a word about that? And how do you, you know, how did you find these examples? I guess I think as a as a non-specialist in this field, it's fascinating what records do survive, even though the trade was illegal. Yeah. Talk about Le, Le Jeune Louis, and then I want you to talk also about the ship called the Serpent, which is a, a different kind of case. And then the ship that at the end of the book you you start with yeah. called uh, the Negrito. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing that I'm going to tell you is that I write about real people because I don't know how to write about anything else. Well, that's great. That's great. If yeah. you read any of my well, articles, people, any of my books, you know, it's like no, and these I are useless. People. The captains, the people, the surgeons who kept journals, and so on and so on. I mean, yeah. Um, I, I, I really cannot, I, I don't know. I don't know how to write out anything else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew, probably would be a better historian. No, you know, no, 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 uh, don't go there, don't go there. <laughs> um, serendipity is how I found the, the, the John Lewis. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have this, um, this uh, compulsive need to tell all my friends that if they find something that they think that I can use to send yeah. it to me. And they are aware of the research that I'm doing, and I, I actually make a lot of friends in this business, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, 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 I do, I do. <laughs> um, and, and to a certain extent, many of them are responsible for for whatever I write. And and in this case, um, this this ship, um, the the papers of this ship, for some reason, ended up in the Huntington Library in California. Really? That's what uh, I yeah, oh. yeah. Huh. And and the good old Huntington, of, uh, yeah. they have they have stuff, man. Yeah. They have stuff. And a friend of mine, uh, who is also a colleague, an amazing historian as well, Karen Racine, mm -hmm. she found them and she sent them to me. And this is then I read the papers and I was like, whoa, <laughs> look what you found. Uh, and this, as you say, is, is a really exceptional case. These people are actually, and and actually, this illustrates exactly how British abolitionist policies and French abolitionist policies at this stage are going to affect um, uh, both crews and Africans. Um, mm -hmm. This ship could have arrived in Cameroon, load the ship and go back to, to across the Atlantic, but they, do, they, they don't do that because they are under constant surveillance from anti-slave trade patrol ships. Mm -hmm. So they, they are forced to come and go and stay along the, 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 the coast of West Africa for months before they, they can actually load the ship and run to, towards the Americas. And by the time that this happened, they are all sick. The crew is already sick at the time that the ship leaves. And the Africans, they embark there. They, they are not subject as before, as in the 18th century, to any kind of medical um, assessment. So they, they, they pack a ship with, with um, uh, people who are already sick, pretty sick. Oh. And of course, this leads to a lot of, uh, to a very like high a mortality. Hospital. It was already like a hospital ship. Yeah. 
very high mortality. The doctor, the, the medical practitioner will die, so that yeah. makes things even worse. Yeah, they have no uh, so-called surgeon anymore. It's just incredible, horrible yeah, story. Yeah. Uh, they, but they made it. They made it to Havana, and, and the Africans ended up in, in you know, they're being, they, they end up being sold into probably plantations or, 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 or other parts of the island. So I, I really, don't, I really don't feel, yeah. I don't feel very sad or sorry for them in general. You know? Um, for the for the slave dealers, I mean. Um, the second one is we were actually talking a little bit about it before. It's a serpent, and this is a ship that is patrolling the, the Caribbean waters in in the 18, mid eighteen thirties. It's a patrol. It's a, really, it's a British patrol ship. Yeah, right? it's a British yeah. patrol ship, and it's it's quite an interesting story because they, first of all, they help the Spanish government government repress um, a liberal uprising that yeah. takes place in Santiago de Cuba in eighteen thirty six. Mm -hmm. And a former PhD of a student of mine that probably is in the audience here, Jesus Sanjur, who's writing a book about that. And, and then they go to, to Puerto Prince in 1836, mm -hmm. and they actually, this guy, McLaren, he actually described everything he sees over there. He described the, the markets, the, the, the Sunday markets, the weekend markets. He described a military parade. He described his interaction with Haitians mm -hmm. with, in, in a way that I've never seen it anywhere, to be honest with you, in primary sources anywhere. So it's a really, really interesting case. But again, this is a ship where you can see, this is writing everything that is happening, how this sea is actually getting through the crew. Yeah. Slowly. As every time they capture a uh, slave ship, you see how this sea returns to the ship and they start dying. At some point, they get yellow fever on board, actually. Um, yeah, and the captain, the captain, I think he quotes the captain just complaining about the sheer terror of losing all of his crew. They're just yeah, dying yeah. like flies. They, yeah. and, you know, it's a permanent right. anxiety. They live in a permanent yeah. anxiety. Yeah. Got and it. the Negrito, which is the last um, ship here, it was a slave ship. It, it was owned by a family of Basque slave traders in Havana. I actually wrote an article about them, about this family, the Sangronis. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, they, um, they have several ships going across the Atlantic back and forth. Uh, Henry Lovejoy has written about this book, about this uh, ship as well. Uh -huh. And, and, um, it's, it's, it, the ship has a, a really, really interesting story. Has been, they have been engaged in the slave trade since the, the mid-1820s. It uh, had changed its name a couple of times. Uh, the Africans who are on board, some of them, including a child who actually leads them, are going to protagonize one of the main mm. uprisings, African uprisings that ever took place in Havana in 1833, yeah. uh, in, in downtown Havana. And many years later, some of them are actually going to go back to Africa and they stop somewhere in the UK. I think Southampton, I want to say Southampton, maybe it's Portsmouth, maybe mm -hmm. somebody here can tell me. Um, they, are, they are actually, they appear in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, even their, their physical appearance is, is described. They are interviewed by mm -hmm. the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society for the world before they made their way back to, to West Africa. That is, that is a really interesting story behind this one as well. But the picture, the, the painting of the ship, it's one of the most fascinating uh, yeah, things I have ever seen. Yeah. In fact, that's what's on your cover, uh, and it's on our posters. Say a word about yeah. that, because it's a remarkable painting, but you went in there with, I'm guessing, a magnifying glass. I did. And yeah, and you're Literally. looking at over 70 bodies you see on that, that surface, I mean, on the deck. Yeah. But do we know any more about the artist or how this came about? It's an uh, amazing well, the artist was, was a French aristocrat that was passing through Havana and he painted a lot. He painted a lot of scenes from Havana and also in Mexico when he visited Mexico. Yeah. But in, in this case, you can actually see very specific details as well. Like you can see the tents where yeah. I, I, I mean, I used to read a lot about the tents that the British crews would put up to protect the Africans from the sun and the rain. But yeah. I never imagined how they were until I saw this, this painting. I saw yeah. the actual tents which was kind of a revelation, but you can also see the, suffer the human suffering. You can see some of them, um, uh, they, they are prostrated, some of them are actually laying down, some of them are really, you can tell that they are in a very bad shape, um, yeah. which, which pretty much actually illustrates, and, and this, and I actually make a point of, of, of um, uh, reflecting on this and the conclusion, this is a ship that if you read the paperwork about this ship when it arrives in Havana, yeah. it's kind of a ship that arrives in, in a pretty good shape. Right? Yeah. The British Commission is in Havana are saying, well, you know, it's there are some people sick in this ship, but it's okay. Yeah. 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 And yeah. it's not okay. No, 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 no. Do you have any sense of the, I mean, I want to get to these questions because they're possible. 
do you have any sense of the scale of numbers in this era? Let's say from 1820 to the 1860s, 70s, down to final Cuban emancipation. The, maybe even just to Cuba alone, are there any numbers we have now? Of how many Africans died coming, well, let's just say to Cuba. Forget about Brazil for the moment and all the rest of the country. Well, and then how many of them may have survived into the plantations? I mean, because we're talking now two and three generations later before Cuba finally ends slavery. Yeah. Um, it's just, you know, the, the process of this, um, the, the, the using up of human beings here is, uh, is almost hard to fathom, but it's real, very real. Yeah. Yeah. What, are, what are some numbers, if you have any? Numbers have always yeah. been a, you know, yeah. a, a big fight in slave trade scholarship, but. Yeah, we're, talk, we're talking hundreds of thousands, but um, overall, and, mm. and this is counting those who didn't make it across the Atlantic, this, are, this is counting those who didn't even make it to the coast, yeah. but, also, but also this is counting those who die within weeks or months after they land. Right. And, and they die from, from diseases they contracted in the, in, in, in the, sure. in the Atlantic crossing or from the sea, or, or from, from the suffering they actually endure during the, the, the mm -hmm. Atlantic crossing of, of what happened right after. And usually these figures, and this is a point, a point that I actually try to make, and I, I just saw Richard Anderson is here, and we have discussed this with the two of us. Um, this, these numbers usually are not in, included in, um, in, in the mortality numbers when we discuss the transatlantic slave trade. And there are, there are significant talk about numbers. Middle, middle passage numbers. Yeah, there are, I don't, I, I see calling me, Middle passes, but I'm not using middle passes anymore because for the 19th century, really, there is nothing in the middle. It's, it's a back and forth thing. Uh, mm -hmm. But but yes, there is, there is there are significant numbers, significant numbers mm -hmm. um, that die within very short periods after landing, which have never been counted, or uh, as far as I know, have not been counted in the in 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 among this this huge figure that is given for 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 the transatlantic slavery, which makes it worse, of course. Well, as the American poet said, uh, you know that. Slave trade was this uh, journey through death to life upon these shores. Yeah. Uh, or as Nathan Huggins yeah. once said, the slave trade was but a cruel filter of human beings. It's, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, I, we got to get to the questions. Uh, I'm, I'm unfortunately, I have a lot of other things I want to ask you. And maybe the, it'll come out in the questions. And that is how this was all still part of this world of colonial and imperial, imperial power. But let, uh, Julia Mansfield, also a former fellow here, uh, has this question. You can see it here. Uh, yeah, can you talk about the black women who worked as nurses, yeah. specifically caring for white sailors, captains, merchants, and so on? She's come across references to this. What can you say about that? Um, yeah, OK. Um, this is quite an interesting question. Uh, for, for most of the documents that I saw, um, there were our men. Um, mm -hmm. They were written by men and they were our men. We do have, and there are some cases, and, and I've, I've seen a few cases, and for instance, if you're studying, um, I don't know, French and Domingue, or if you're studying plantations, or the, the, the role of women is much more um, um, apparent. But, um, but in the slave trade as such, uh, there, are, there are a few references, but they are not, they are not that forthcoming. Um, and I think that I mentioned a couple in the book, but they're really not, not, mm. um, I, I actually look for them, you should know, I, I, I have this, um, mm -hmm. uh, this, since I started organizing this conference in, in Yale, the Cuban Slavery Conference, and we started mm -hmm. talking about statues, I kind of have looking even more for, for the role of women in any story that I'm, I'm, I'm telling. And, mm -hmm. and here, unfortunately, this is story told by men, and usually white men as well. Mm -hmm. And where women really are not given the the, the time and, and yeah yeah attention that they, they probably deserve. Well, Sorry, no doubt. Uh, Tim uh, Tim Weiskel is asking about the origin of of this notion of quarantine and wonders about the ship doctors. I think I yeah. can read this too. Did you get access to uh, the manuscripts of ship doctors and how how they came up with this notion of Quarantine and how they use it. Um, I did. I did. I did. Came across published 
diary, I mean, publish a, a manuscripts. Yeah, they, yeah. they wrote yeah. about it. And, and why they produce this knowledge is in itself interesting because at the time, right. who was going to read that? But that, that some of them actually are arguing <clears throat> that in the, in the 1820s, 1830s, there, is, there, are, there are manuals to yeah. deal with the diseases in, in places like India or the Americas and say there was nothing for Africa. So they are basically trying to cover a gap in knowledge when they're writing. But also, I, I, I actually work with several um, log books written by, by uh, surgeons on, on, uh -huh. on uh -huh. slave trade patrols. And uh -huh. also some letters, quite a few letters from, from practitioners who put up slave ships, including, I, I actually write all this, this is one of my favorite bits about this, this book, is the famous medi medicine chest yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that reading. actually very often they they were the conclusive proof that, that that the ship was involved in the slave trade, even if they didn't have slave on board. The medicine chest, how much medicine you have, and and what kind of medicine you have, um, huh. and not only that, I actually found in in the archives in London a, a, once a, a pouch with um, the letters of the doctor and the captain. Wow, it's exciting. Um, so if a uh, ship was if a ship was going say from wherever Lisbon or somewhere to the coast of Africa, and they found they found this surgeon's chest, that would that would be evidence enough to seize it. Yeah, especially oh. after <clears throat> after the Equipment Act in the in the mid eighteen thirties, any uh -huh. any ship that was considered to be equipped for for the trade would be stopped and 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 probably taken to, to one of the mixed commission courses by us, by his admirative course for, for adjudication. And, and, and the medicine uh, chest became like a, a conclusive proof. It was interesting. The, Evident. From that. As for the quarantines, to be honest with you, they were there before. Um, I, if, if there is anything, anything that I can actually say about this is that there is an amazing book, um, no more, actually more than one amazing book by Alison Bashford, Our Quarantines and Contagions as well. Uh -huh. which are worth um, reading. Although in, in, in this specific environment, we don't have any single quarantine. So probably something for somebody to... There's a book out there waiting to be written. Yeah. Go for it, everybody. Helen Yang asks an interesting question here. Slavery by making bodies into property denied their vitality and aliveness. How did transmission and threat of all these diseases either undermine or support this idea? I, I guess the idea is this notion of being alive. And then she says, thank you so much for this wonderful event and wonderful book. But anyway, that's uh, a Helen, somewhat uh, abstract question, but it's interesting. <laughs> um, that's hard to get. That's kind of a yeah. question about the psychology of yeah. the Africans, in a way. The, the, and the Africans are, and, and the, 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 the traffickers as well, the human traffickers as well. Yeah. Um, the, there is yeah. a, 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 two dimensions here. And, and I, from the point of view of the Africans, I, I have never personally, and this is a discussion maybe we can have uh, aside at some point, I have never bought into the idea of the social death. Never. Uh -huh. What I have seen repeatedly in the record is that they are pretty much alive and they are pretty much ready to fight back. Um, yeah. and, and I don't like to use the word agency, but they are pretty much capable of doing things, uh, sure. including having families when, whenever they have the opportunity or, you know, taking revenge and cutting the head off of somebody who they like when not the honest when they are right. Mm. Um, and in, in my opinion, by the way, so, so I, I want to make this clear in the 19th century, many of these Africans were crossing the Atlantic. And this is related to my previous book. They were soldiers. Very often, they are yeah. the entire military units are crossing the Atlantic together. Right. Um, in my previous book, I actually even questioned whether they considered themselves as slaves. Probably, they considered themselves as prisoners of war. Uh, more likely. So right. there are there are different dimensions there. As from from the point of view of the human traffickers, which is yeah. what I maybe what this is this, your question is, is even more. Uh, challenging. Um, huh. I I really think that this they were property, as you say correctly. I completely agree with that, and they were also disposable. So they mm. are going to have disease, but that doesn't. I mean, everybody is aware that this disease can can cross in any direction, and as if anything, the whites are 
very much aware they are more susceptible to die from any of these diseases than the Africans. And this is one of the main uh, uh, justifications for the transatlantic mm -hmm. slave trade since the 16th century. Is this um, idea that is in the, in the Colombian exchange with since Africa cross the road that book is that, you know, um, the uh, Amerindian populations were dying of disease, but the Africans were more resistant. So mm -hmm. off you go. Um, and that combined with the supply play into, into the hands of the uh, slave traders and, and, and owners of the slave. But they are, they are not going to have any hesitation in disposing of the bodies in any form or way, including, including living bodies. I'm going to use an anecdote to, to show this and not extend myself too much on this. <laughs> there is a, um, um, a slave trader, very famous in this period, um, Theodore Cano. Mm -hmm. And Theodore Cano is, is on, a, on, a, on a transatlantic trip to Havana from West Africa, and he makes friends, because these people were also human beings, you know, terrible human beings, but still human beings. Um, and he makes friends with a very young African um, who he takes under his wing. He's one of the slaves in the, the African, mm -hmm. the slave Africans in the ship. And this kid, this child, suddenly so starts showing symptoms, if I recall well, of a smallpox. Mm. So Cano, who has taken to this kid, has to make an informed choice. Do, do we um, kill him, um, avoid an epidemic, mm. or do we live and live and we take the chance? And this is a no-brainer, really. He liked it very much. He, I took, you know, I pretty much felt bad about this, but I throw him overboard or something like that. I don't remember what he was. So he killed the, kid, the child, which is a, the bottom line of the story. So there is a human dimension here that is more, yeah. it's really more complex than life or death. Um, but at the very end of the day, as you said, they are property and they will be treated as property um, as in, in as much as they affect the value of the car, of the human car. You know, if they are going to, Life is not that important. It's uh, your, your story is about the dark heart of evil and the dark heart of tragedy. Uh, it's both. Uh, uh, we have a question here from a public health specialist at Stanford University named Yasmin Reyes. Um, she's interested in how disease transmission mitigation strategies vary between those doing the trading such as quarantine and other strategies that would have been used by the enslaved people. So uh, what, what did the enslaved people themselves bring to this uh, versus what the slaves yeah. are bringing to this? And there, uh, it, it's fascinating what you said about these military units. Some of these guys must have had their own practices yeah. about, about health from, from yeah. warfare. But, so both sides here are contributing to this world of trying to mitigate the disease. Talk a bit about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, I have to say that this, this Jasmine Reyes person, she's like my sister. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know. All right, uh, well, well uh, brother, you, got, you got a tough one here from your sister. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, long story, many, many years. Uh -huh. um, well, that's so a Jasmine, small question then, God. Yeah, Jasmine, to answer your question, um, what happened here is there is a huge, exchange of knowledge and it's going in all directions and one of the things that i actually try to avoid here as well to have said that from the beginning is to follow this um, narrative of the heroic european or white westerner arriving in a disaster zone to quote certain oxford academic and getting tainted by there by this place okay so mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. we have been subject even today we are being subject if you recall the oxfam scandal in haiti a few years ago there were people coming out defending these oxfam workers because they wouldn't have done these kind of things if they wouldn't have been forced by um mm -hmm. the environment being an disaster zone you know they weren't engaged in, 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 in a prostitution ring which is you know um <clears throat> anyway my point is that i, I try to avoid doing this from the beginning and, and one of the results of doing that is that immediately Practitioners from all backgrounds, including Amerindian, but mostly Africans, are going to start coming out. And, and, and their, their surgical knowledge, their knowledge of botany, their knowledge of um, uh, uh, how to um, deal with, with um, diseases vis a vis the elements, uh, this is knowledge that the Europeans are going to learn from them. Um, and, and the Europeans are going to be very willing to learn, even though very often they are going to dismiss them. At the same time, they're actually taking that knowledge in. 
And this, right. this you can see in Africa, you can see in the Middle Passes, and you can see in the Americas. Mm. This, mm. this interaction and, and slave ships, for instance, um, the, the practitioners on, on slave ships may very often wear uh, certified surgeons from medical schools in Europe or in the United States, including Yale University. Uh, and and, and um, they were also very often just um, uh, Amerindians or Africans who never went to, to college, but they, the, the American knowledge was considered to be um, not only sufficient, it was considered to be pretty good as mm. to taking care of entire ships and entire human cargoes in the hope that they are going to make it across the Atlantic healthy. Mm. So mm. It's, it's pretty much an exchange, mm. um, an exchange yeah. environment. Well, and then it's still an exchange once people arrive here in all parts of the New World or the Americas. The ongoing exchange of acculturation, uses of health practices, medicines, food, and so on, that never stops uh, through this brutal filter. Uh, there's another question here. A Adrian Van Dyke wants you to settle some of the numbers questions of the slave trade here. Uh, oh, how many Africans? <laughs> yeah, I know. This goes back years. Of oh dear. Battle. Let me see. Let me see a question. Let me see. Oh, uh, uh, Adrian, I don't know if I can answer this. Wait a minute. Let me. Let me. He heard that fifty uh, of a fifty percent death rate before embarkation within Africa. I, I don't know about that. Then the death rate on board was what? That means middle passage death rates. This. Yeah. Um. Uh, and then she says she's heard this figure of 12 to 13 million transported in the trade. Anything you can put on that to, to help? Yeah, that, that last figure, we have it through the transatlantic slave trade database. Yeah. Uh, the other, I mean, the figures you can get them from the transatlantic slave trade database, which are oh, figures yeah. that we think we can see, this is a, the most amazing um, project tool related to a slave trade to happen in the past 50 years, I would say. I think that we are indebted to all the, the colleagues who did this, starting with David Deltis, but also a whole team, Herbert Klein, Stephen Berendt, uh, all, yeah. all the people who are involved in this, and I'm sure I'm, I'm forgetting somebody. David um, Richardson. David Richardson, oh my God, David Richardson. He's never sorry, gonna forgive me. Right, anyway, <laughs> uh, he will forgive me. Um, so, all, all the figures are there. Um, there are two, two caveats to this. So one of them is that, because especially in the 19th century, these this journeys across the Atlantic, these voyages across the Atlantic are going to be illegal. Very often we don't have yeah. the right figures. So we have approximate numbers. And, and these numbers have been calculated based on different variables. I'm not the right person to do that. Maybe if Daniel Dominguez is in the, in the audience, he could probably pop it and, and say that he's yeah. here. He will explain it better than I can. Uh, but um, they, they were calculated based on, on different variables. And, and the other thing is that, as I said before, there are deaths associated to the transatlantic slave trade that don't happen on water. They happen oh. on dry land, on both right. sides, before and after. Sometimes yeah. very much before, sometimes very much after. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they are not um, um, uh, included in these figures given by the transatlantic slave trade database which maybe with some reason they are not there, but, but to a certain extent, they are part of that story as well. These people are also going to like because of the slave trade. Well, and the slave trade database project was, it was a careful economic, statistical, and cartographical study that is extraordinary. We, we don't take much credit for this, but we did the, at the GLC here at Yale, we did the slave trade atlas, the Atlantic slave trade atlas which is both in a book form and online uh, with David Eltis, David Richardson and others, uh, and a brilliant cartographer who was, I believe from Madison, Wisconsin. But anyway, that is worth consulting both on the remarkable geography of this epic story, but also on the numbers, because you get then numbers from different ports, individual ports, you get disembark embarkation and disembarkation numbers. So those interested in the numbers out there go to to the slave trade atlas and the slave trade database for sure and it is an old argument in this field as not everyone knows it goes back 50 years and more when this field started as a as a modern i did my minor field in this way back at wisconsin in graduate school and man there were 
some of the most heated debates I've ever read about uh, in, in the yeah. Journal of African History uh, over the numbers of the slave, slave trade. God, there was a politics to that. And that has subsided, at least in recent years, because of the database. But we've got a lot of other questions here. They're all from, mostly all from Tim Weiskel. Uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and then there's some others here, too. Uh, he's having quite a dialogue with you. Uh, but there's a question from Janny that says, where were the infected people coming from? Were they purchasing Africans already infected from the factories? I think you've already sort of answered that, but you want to take that up a little yeah, bit? They, yeah, they are. They are. And actually, I think I can also answer one of the questions of Tim um, at the same time, because he's asking about the epidemics. Um, the, 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 the problem with illegal slave trade after 1807, and especially after 1820, said, um, as I said before, the embarkation is going to, to happen very quickly. As in some cases, we have documented cases in which a slave ship embarks an entire human cargo within four hours. Within four hours, they arrive in the African coast, put the people on board, and leave. Four yeah. hours to avoid the cruises from the British uh, uh, Navy and the French Navy. So um, they, they, with, with this kind of, of rushing, of course, there is no time to really examine um, the, the health of the people they are putting on board. And of course, it's going to bring disease. But there is also another, an, another element here. Is that, again, because of the blockade that the yeah. different nations are, are putting in place in, in West Africa so that the slave trade ends, very often they have to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until they have an opportunity. So they spend months waiting. The case of Leon Louis is one of them. Right. Uh, and in that time, they are close enough to the coast to get the mosquitoes. Um, and as you can imagine, the diseases like yellow fever and malaria come on board. And to link with, with one of the questions of Tim, um, there, are, there are quite a lot of epidemics. It's actually, the, the, the ones that really jump out of the page, even though there is cholera, as you say, are the yellow fever ones, because they are cyclical, almost cyclical. Almost every, almost every seven or eight years, you have one. So 1823, you have one. Mm -hmm. 1829, 30, you have another one. Then mm -hmm. 1837, then 1840. Five, I think, so they, they keep coming and they keep coming. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, because the ships are there as well, they are, they are the ones moving people around. At some point, the British actually try to, you're talking about Cape Verde, but I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'm going to jump to another island, I'm going to jump to Fernando Po. Uh, the British try to move the, the, the settlement, of, 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 not the settlement, sorry, the Vice Admiralty Corps they had in, in Sierra Leone, in Freetown, they tried to move it to Fernando Po. Mm -hmm. And they they pretty much were set. They were going to buy the island from Spain. The island belonged to Spain back then, or they, even though they didn't have it uh, inhabited or populated by Spanish. And and what happens is that this is 1829, and in 1829 the yellow fever epidemic starts. And one of the places that is places that is worst hit is Fernando Po, and they abandoned the idea completely. But they also tried to settle in the Isles of Los uh, near um, Arcadia as well. So all, all these little islands over there, they are all, as you say, they are going to play an important role. I would say, though, that the main players in this story are Ascension Island mm -hmm. and especially Santelina. These mm -hmm. are the two that really, really take a, a, a significant role in this story. Mm. Well, I'm going to give you one last question to take a crack at, if, if you will, and then we'll pull this to an end. Uh, you know, in, in this engine of capitalism that is growing and growing in the 19th century uh, all over the Atlantic world, um, Western Europe, the Americas, Africa, Brazil, South America, all over. Uh, this trade never ends. It just never ends. I mean, it does finally, finally, finally end, although it's transferring over to the Indian Ocean world too, and that goes on into the 20th century. And despite the hideous scale of death from disease in this story, which you document here and you show, why did it keep running? Is it just the profit motive? Is that how we explain it uh, in the end? Yeah. Is it, yeah. is it, it's, it's, just, it's just a profit. It's, it's a need for, lay, for cheap labor. The desperation um, for labor continues right through the 19th century, yeah. especially and it in will have continued until to, It will have continued. Yeah. It, was, it, it stopped because Eventually, people came around to the idea of stopping it, but it would have continued otherwise. There were people who were ready to carry on um, 
in the Americas, in Europe, and in Africa. Mm. Because we usually think of the slave trade as this thing that the Africans, they, they, they fought wars to capture um, uh, prisoners of war and sell them to the transatlantic slave trade or the Trans-Saharan or whatever. Um, and we think about the European, about, about, yeah, the Americans or the Europeans buying them and taking them to America and exploiting them in the plantations. But there are, there are many other dimensions here. The British are still uh, investing heavily on, this, on the transatlantic slave trade in different um, aspects of the transatlantic slave trade, including providing weapons uh, and um, irons, uh, you name it, fabrics, Fabrics of Manchester are famous in the West African coast. They've in the declared the trade illegal, but they're still investing in it. Yeah, and, and actually I, I examined a PhD student um, a, a, a few years ago in, in Durham, the Durham University, and Joe is his name. I always forget his name, but his name is Joe. And he wrote an amazing PhD dissertation about British investment in, in Brazilian slavery until the very, very, very end of slavery in the Americas. That is British investment there. Um, so... There was, as long as the main chance was out there, there were people who would do it. Yeah. And, and now, and, and by, by this middle of the 19th century and even later, this, this has gone on for just generations and generations and generations. I mean, this yeah. is you know, a practice that is- as Mulham, old. Joe Mulham, sorry. Yeah, there you go. I remember his name. Yeah. And at the end of your book, you call this a story of familiarity and strangeness. I like that phrase. What do you mean by that? No. I mean that the, the, even the worst of them, the worst of human beings, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they are all affected by disease and they are all um, uh, interacting with each other, sharing their, their life experiences, sharing, sharing, you know, yeah, there are very good people there. Um, there is no question about that. Um, and, and there are people who are pretty much completely innocent that they are thrown that they are the event there but mm -hmm. their life they come they come into contact with each other their life crisscross to, throughout the the, the, mm -hmm. the period and sometimes more than once mm -hmm. and and it is important I think to look at the experience of every every actor here this is the first time actually and, and probably this has answered your question even better this is the first time that I choose not to look at the and not, not just not to tell the story only of Africans. Yeah, I mean, I have been going about. If, if anybody who knows my research knows that I spend most of my academic life talking about the importance of bringing the right. history of Africans into the, the Atlantic stories that we tell, of um, because I, they, usually yeah. many Atlantic historians don't even uh, pay that much attention to to Africa. But this is it, although it has changed significantly the past twenty years. But, um, mm -hmm. But you're not, um, making, you're not trying to make value judgments. No, 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 not at all. Along the way, no. you're trying to describe and explain at the same time, this is a moral monstrosity. Yeah, yeah. And we all know that. Um, but how did it happen? And the words of this, the, the words of these guys, they had their own fears. So if you read the book, you will see that terrible, terrible human beings. That is a, a, a slave ship captain who has just raped, because there is no other way of putting this, a young child, and he's dying. Mm -hmm. and, and you can actually see both sides of the story. At the same time he's dying, he's actually telling the story of how he raped this girl. And you can see the fear, he's actually saying goodbye, he's writing a letter saying goodbye to his friends in Havana. And at the same time he's mentioning this girl, you know, it was given to him as a present, you know, and he, you know, he got lucky when she was a virgin, probably she was 10 years old, God knows, I don't remember now. The banality it's, of evil. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, heart of darkness. Uh, exactly. And yet, it is how millions of people came to these Americas. It is how so many parts of the American is, Americas became African and still are. <laughs> uh, it is how all these cultures and all these peoples mixed and had been mixing for 300 years, 400 years almost. Yeah, um, yeah. well, uh, once again, a marvelous book, uh, a harrowing book, um, but told about, again, <laughs> real ships, real people, real places. At the same time, it's about these gigantic human forces and economic forces, to say the least. I like the fact that you didn't just say, 
this is a story of horror and it's a story of capitalism and just tell us about the forces colliding with each other. It's, a, it's about people at the end of the day who are both uh, evil and, and good, who are victims and survivors. So Manuel, thank you. And uh, thank you. we're gonna see you in a week yeah. uh, on the screen, unfortunately. We won't be able to invite all of our wonderful guests at that conference out for a great dinner. Uh, but we have, as uh, you know well, um, we have created a Spotify playlist of Cuban music that we will be playing during the lunch hour when you get a break. Uh, we're going to do our best. We were even going to try to deliver Cuban food to everybody who signed up, and then we realized logistically that really wasn't going to work. <laughs> can, I, can I say something before we go? Because I, I promised sure, myself please. I would, and I, for, I, I wanted to do it at the beginning. And I know my editor is here, Adina Work. Yeah, Adina. Um, and I, I just have to say that without her, this book wouldn't have seen the light. And she was a delight to work with. I'm hoping that I can work with her in the future again. Uh, and um, yeah, that. Well, I, I think you probably will. <laughs> and Adina, I know you're out I there. So. Thank you for attending. Uh, we would have brought you on here if it was technologically possible, and maybe it was. But anyway, thank you all for coming to this. Thank you all for attending. And Manuel, especially yeah, thank you. to you. And we'll see you all next week at our conference on, on Cuba. Thanks thank so you. much. Stay on a minute if you can, Manuel. Yeah, yeah.